So as you heard in the introduction, I've been at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory for just about all of my career. And one thing that I wanted to point out is that Brookhaven has a tuition refund program. I started at the lab with an associate's degree, got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree through their tuition refund program. Um, and happy to say that many opportunities were made available to me during my career there. So I started in the in the procurement area, uh, got involved in the business end of things, and now um, I'm the project manager for the electron ion collider. So uh, I, I encourage people and, and uh, younger people that you know to look into opportunities at Brookhaven because it's a, because it's a really nice place to work. So we Brookhaven is funded almost exclusively by the Department of Energy. And the mission of that department is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing energy and environmental and, and nuclear challenges. Uh, one leg of the Department of Energy is the Office of Science. And that's the office that funds uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory and other national laboratories around uh, the US. So there are 17 national laboratories throughout the United States, all uh, in different regions. Uh, we are sister laboratories, we work together. So um, one of the things that was mentioned in my bio and one of the things I regularly do is we support each other, this um, um, uh, sisterhood of laboratories. So when they have big projects going on, I take my expertise and I bring it to their lab. And we asked in individuals from their lab to come to visit us to help us with our projects. Uh, so it's a nice uh, domestic community. So Brookhaven was established in 1947. It's managed by Brookhaven Science Associates, which is a partnership of Stony Brook University and Battelle. Um, we are closely associated with core universities in the Northeast, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT, Columbia, and Cornell. Um, our annual budget is about 600 million. We have about 2,500 employees. Many of those um, scientific staff are joint appointments. We have over 500 students that do work at Brookhaven. We bring in about 30,000 students a year. They come through to visit um, our science museum and the different departments that we have. Uh, the actual site itself is over 5,000 acres with 316 billion, uh, buildings. I encourage you, um, if you've never visited Brookhaven, the, we open up Brookhaven National Laboratory over the summer um, to bring people in to tour. This year we did it virtually, uh, but it's during the months of July and August. It's pretty fun if you have little kids too, kind of something fun to do on a Sunday. Um, one of the things that's special about Brookhaven National Laboratory, as opposed to the uh, other 16 national labs, is that we are very focused on users. And when I say users, I mean scientists um, from universities and scientists from other laboratories, scientists from uh, around the world who come to use our facilities. Uh, so they will come for a few days or a month to do research um, at the large machines that we have to offer. And one of the advantages of a national laboratory is that they can build these large machines that a university would never have the funds to build or frankly the facilities um, in order to do it. So that is one thing that makes the national lab special. And one thing that makes Brookhaven very special in that we have a number of these large user facilities. Before I worked um, on the electron ion collider, I uh, helped deliver the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, which you can see in this picture here. We have some students out in front of the building. Um, and that, what, that is also a user facility, um, a slightly different kind than the one we're building now, but a facility where researchers and students and professors come to do research. This is what the site actually looks like. 
Um, down here in the lower right is the National Synchrotron Light Source, the project that I helped build. Uh, one of the fun things is when you fly out of Islip, um, the planes do a loop before they head west and they loop right over Brookhaven National Lab. And I always want to lean out the window, lean next to the person next to me and say, hey, I built that facility down there. So it's fun when you look at it from this perspective. Now, the big ring up at the top, that's the realistic heavy ion collider. And that is the facility that we are going to upgrade for the electron ion collider. That's about two miles in circumference. And having that facility at Brookhaven helped Brookhaven win the siting decision for this project. Not all projects are like this, but this particular project, the electron ion collider, there was a competition that we had to engage in in order to get that project sited here at Brookhaven. And we found out uh, back in January that Brookhaven won um, and that this $2 billion about dollar facility would be built here on Long Island, opening jobs and keep helping to keep people employed and construction workers uh, uh, busy. So that was, that was a really special, a special day when they made that announcement. So what is an electron ion collider? Now, I'm not a scientist. Um, so I borrow these sli this slide from some of my science friends. And what this machine does is it allows us to see inside the proton. And the idea is you collide um, ions together and they burst. And what happens inside of those is captured in pictures that a detector can see. So it allows you to see inside things that you would never ever be able to see otherwise. And depending on the type of facility that's built, you can look at things in different ways. Um, so this type of facility will be the first of its kind. Um, so it is sure to you know, open up uh, interesting things that uh, people wouldn't know otherwise. And this is really pretty basic research. So it's not um, as easy as saying, you know, this will be the beginning of the next computer or the next greatest technology. You really don't know um, what the future holds when you start to look at things you've never looked at before. So it really is opening up you know, brand new ways of looking at things. So it's, it's exciting from that perspective, but the results are really, it's not tomorrow that we're gonna know the impact of this, it, it will take longer. So it's not that we just thought about this in, you know, 2019 or 2020, the Department of Energy has been working on the research associated with this machine since back in 2002. And one of the things that the Department of Energy does is it has these toll gates that you have to go through in order to get a project from concept to actual delivery. And that first toll gate step is developing a mission need for a machine like this. And that took from 2002 until 2018 for researchers to get to the point where they felt comfortable in moving forward with a facility like this one. So that mission need was approved in January of 2019. We went through a series of reviews and site assessments during 2019. The Department of Energy said in December of 2019 that yes, there's a mission need for a facility like this. And then um, a few weeks later, it was announced that Brookhaven uh, won the siting decision. We were in competition with Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility, which is another national lab in Virginia. Um, and it was a little awkward for that whole year because these are our colleagues and our friends and we were competing. Um, but Brookhaven um, had the advantage of having that existing facility and the expertise. Um, so we were able to secure the siting at Brookhaven. We are now partnered with them though, because the Department of Energy said, both of your organizations, both of your laboratories have expertise. 
I want you to work together now to deliver this new facility so that we've been working on a partnership with them over the last year. And now we are getting ready for the next toll gate uh, in January of 2021. And that's when the cost range will be finalized and our preliminary plans uh, will be put in place. So this is what it looks like over to the left here. The smaller picture is what the existing facility looks like. This is what is underground. Um, we are going to add additional equipment and an electron storage ring and put some detectors in and some um, high tech equipment and add it to that existing facility. The fact that we had the tunnel already underground saved us an enormous amount of money and was part of the reason uh, that we were able to secure Brookhaven um, as the winner for the Electron Ion Collider. So I'm a project person, so we don't start any work until we have a work breakdown structure. So we take all the work that we need to do to deliver the Electron Ion Collider and we lay it out kind of in a plan where every little piece of the machine gets um, detailed out with cost and schedule information. And we develop 10 high level areas that we need in order to deliver an electron ion collider. We need a project management team. We have to do some development in R&D. And then we have various components of the machine, an injector, a storage ring, the place where the beams come together is called the interaction region. We have tons of support we need to provide for the team. We have to build infrastructure. We have to get ready to operate it. And then we are building one, at least one, maybe two detectors, which are um, kind of the cameras that are gonna take the pictures at the collision point. So this is what I use to manage the project. We also have been working with the Department of Energy to come up with a profile of what the cost might look like. And they agreed with us that a cost of about 2 billion uh, would be appropriate, but they gave us a cost range of 1.6 to 2.6 billion dollars. Um, so that's what we're working with in order to deliver this. Uh, we're here in 21. Um, we're slated to get a little under $50 million this year, and we ramp up to about $300 million at the peak. So lots of money and lots of jobs and equipment for um, Brookhaven and the local area. That's our, where our uh, reference profile sits. We're well within the range. The goal is we need to stay in this range, so we're in a good spot right now. Um, this is the team that I work with. We each have one of these levels of that work breakdown structure, and we are now developing our cost estimate. One of the really great things that um, happened in the process of getting ready for this project was that New York State agreed to contribute $100 million toward the Electron Ion Collider. And they did that before the siting decision was made. And the reason was is that the Department of Energy looks very favorably on the fact that the state is willing to also contribute to this facility. So uh, uh, their support was very important in getting the siting decision to Brookhaven versus Virginia. So this is what we call our cartoon schedule. We actually have a schedule that is um, put in what Primavera, which is a scheduling tool, but this is what we use to talk about uh, what the timing is. And these critical decisions across the top, those are the toll gates that I talked about. So every time we get to one of these toll gate points, we have to prove that we are ready to move to the next phase. So that mission need at the Department of Energy happened um, right here at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. We're getting ready now to go before a review committee to talk about our preliminary plan to convince them that we are ready to keep moving. Critical decision two is a pretty big one for us. That's when our plan gets frozen. 
So we say we can build this machine for this amount of money on this time frame, and then we are held to that plan. And we are monitored then against that plan. And critical decision three is when we can actually start buying equipment and buildings. And then critical decision 4A and 4 are as we start to finish the project. 4A, we go to operations, and then in 4, the project is over. So this is what we use um, to track ourselves. Um, so we have a detailed schedule with like over 7,000 activities in it, and this is what we're using to put our plan together. Um, having the information in a tool like this allows us to do a lot of things and to do it quickly. So if the Department of Energy calls at noon and says, we need to know what the impact of this kind of a change would be, I have the tools to be able to respond and turn around answers to them quickly. And it allows us starting at critical decision two to be tracking how we're doing against that plan. So a very powerful tool uh, that we have. That tool also enables us to track the kinds of people we need to deliver this project and where we're gonna get them from. Um, so this is an example of one of the departments at Brookhaven Lab, the Collider Accelerator Department that has a lot of staff that we're gonna use on the Electron Ion Collider project. So that yellow horizontal line shows all the staff available in that department. And the red line are the staff that we need for the electron ion collider. And the other lines are all the other things those staff are doing. So when you put everything together, you see the spots where we need more staff than we have. And that you know, helps our HR department determine when they need to hire people. It also tells us not only how many we need, but what kinds of staff we need. And when we put our estimate together, we asked our estimators to say, tell us what you need to do, tell us how long it's gonna take, tell us how many people you need to do it and what kind of people you need. So we can take our tools now and say, tell me how many mechanical techs we need during this year. Tell me how many designers we need coming up in FY21. So that kind of information is now available to us. And what we found was this big peak right here in 21. We need designers. So we now went out and put uh, on the BNL website advertisements for 20 designers. And we also need mechanical engineers. So we have advertisements out there for those. Um, so having, you know, the these these strong tools and people who know how to use them is really helping us to be able to manage a project of this size. This, these tools also enable us to run all kinds of graphs and um, show our information in all different ways. So th this is just an example of the kinds of things we can look at. We can look at how solid is our estimate? Is it made up of vendor quotes? Is it based on historical costs? Is it just somebody's judgment? Is there a design behind it? And then we can look at our split of labor and materials. We can look at it in total at the bottom right or over time. And we can look at, as I mentioned before, what kinds of staff do we need and when do we need them in order to deliver? So really cool things can come, at, come out of this once you have all the information in one one place. You know, it used to be we would stand up and give a talk and we'd look and we go, oh my goodness, that slide doesn't match this slide. Why are the numbers different? Somebody didn't check. You know, we need better quality check. Now everything comes out of one place. So the numbers are never wrong. Maybe we put the wrong numbers in, but they never don't match because they all come from one place. So there's one place where the truth is, which, uh, comes in really handy when you're getting ready for some of these big important reviews. So next steps, we are, as I mentioned, we're getting ready for CD1. Um, and then we will need to work hard to get to CD2. And there's a big ramp up of staff needed. We're gonna get up to about 350 or 400 staff. And right now we have about 50. So we have a long way to go in making sure we have enough enough people to deliver. Many of the people already work at Brookhaven and will be reassigned, 
but many people we will get um, from outside of the laboratory. I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that Brookhaven is doing um, to kind of help support the electron ion collider. And one of those is something called Discovery Park. It's located right near the front gate of Brookhaven. And it is some federal property that is being opened up um, for public-private partnership. And the idea would be that you would be able to get into Discovery Park without having to go through the gate to get into the laboratory because this is a DOE facility. So you need to have a badge to get in or you need to have a guest appointment or you need to get cleared ahead of time. This public private area would be open to everyone. Um, it's going to have um, places where we can have seminars without having to get people guest appointments in order to come to a seminar at Brookhaven. It's going to um, have places for economic development where um, industries that are interested in working with science can, you know, rent a spot or uh, put an office building in there. Um, it's gonna have a daycare center out there. It's gonna have restaurants out there. It's gonna have a hotel out there. All things that will help um, to make Brookhaven more open um, to the outside. And as I mentioned, New York State has given their full support with that $100 million um, infrastructure commitment, but they've also committed to something that makes many people really happy, especially young people, and that is that they are going to move one of the train stations from the one in Yapank to Brookhaven so that people could actually fly into JFK and get on a train. I guess that's the train, the plane to the train that, you know, air, the air train. You get to the LIRR and you could get out to Brookhaven by train, which we've never been able to do before. And we've had issues with people who don't drive coming from Europe or New York City. And now um, New York State has uh, gone through uh, the first steps in moving that, that rail station. So that's really, really exciting from a Brookhaven perspective. We even had some young people in the audience when they announced it, some employees. There was a discussion about medical benefits. And then after that, the train station discussion came up. And somebody raised their head and hand and said, I don't really care about those medical benefits, but you're going to get a train station here. You know, so different way of thinking, but, you know, really, really good for Brookhaven. So this is what Discovery Park would look like. Here's where the front of the lab is right now. You come in and you stop at a booth here. They would open up this whole area. Um, William Floyd Parkway is like right over to the right here. Um, open this up. Right now, the first building, which is the science and user support building is under construction, um, but these other things are being planned. So very exciting, something um, that, you know, it's gonna take time to get there, but it's um, Brookhaven's moving in the right direction. And here is a photograph of the train station. So you can see in purple where the existing train station is and they will move it up right to the edge of the Brookhaven site. So really exciting um, from our, our perspective. And here you can see, here's the Brookhaven site and here is that Discovery Park right near the edge of the facility. Okay, that's my story. So I will stop and be happy to answer questions. Well, you really ended on a high note. That uh, Discovery Park Discovery sounds Park, yeah. amazing. Um, somebody is asking if the slides can be sent. I don't know if you're sharing them. Uh, I'm happy to share them, yes. Okay, so I will. if you send them to me, I will send them to all the participants. Okay. Um, I think somebody asked if you are hiring support staff as well. Yes. So um, we people should check the Brookhaven Lab career page 
Um, right now we have admin staff, designers, engineers. Um, I think that's everything that's up there now, but the, the next two years are like a big ramp up for us. So people should keep their eye out, you know, um, and um, especially if you have friends, relatives, colleagues, people you know who might be interested, we're happy um, to take that into account. We're, try we're trying to use this opportunity to move the diversity needle. We've had a lot, we have a, in general trouble in the science community in you know building up a diverse workforce right many scientists are males many of them are white males um, so we are trying really hard to make sure when we put jobs out that we are bringing in the most diverse group of applicants that we can so that um, you know we try to move that needle a little and using the opportunity of eic to try to do that for the lab Great. Uh, just to let anybody know, they can unmute themselves and ask Diane any questions, but I do see in the chat, um, Alina is asking if the lab collaborates with artists. I wish they did. Um, I have a personal interest in that myself. Um, not that I know of. Yes, I was noticing that that painting behind you. I like it. <laughs> yes. I've always thought, though, that, you know, there's a lot of cool and interesting things um, that, you know, science generates these beautiful, like these detectors, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful diagrams. And I, I asked my husband, the chemist, about this. I said, could I, like, paint that? You think that would be really cool? And he said, we're scientists. It has to be precise. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> like that whole interpretation thing is not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, some of the things you see, even just looking for images to put with the marketing of this program, I thought some of the images were beautiful of the electrons and the, the collider and the images that the, the lab was using on their page. So I think there can be a, a really beautiful a combination of science and art. So maybe Alina, you've got to put something together and pitch it yeah. to the lab and get something going. I have <laughs> actually seen other labs that I visited have had like, you know, contests or, you know, artists come in and make their own, you know, interpretation of what they see and it's all in the lobby. It's beautiful. Yeah. So maybe I need to work on that with my colleague. <laughs> In your free time, right? Yeah. Um, so does anybody else have any other questions? I have a question. Um, Great. Diane. Hi, Diane. I'm Tina Fiorentino with Junior Achievement. Um, it seems this is an amazing project that will provide so much opportunity for jobs in the future for our young folks and who think maybe there's not too many opportunities to stay here on Long Island with jobs. So this is so exciting. Um, so my question to you is, do you do anything to bring students and bring awareness to our students, especially in the high school age where they're starting to think about what could their majors be in college? What are the jobs of the future? Uh, our organization, Junior Achievement, does that. And um, we bring students on site. Well, not right now, but generally uh, we do a lot of job shadowing with our students, bringing them on site. Uh, bringing speakers into the schools and classrooms to talk about, you know, what are the jobs of the future and STEM and just growth here on Long Island and all the opportunities, because I feel like it's, we have so many great projects going on here. And it always amazes me that the students really don't know about this stuff. Um, so starting them in high school is, is, I think the, t the right time. So is there anything like that that we might be able to present to our schools? Um, we're also working on a sustainability summit that we're hoping to um, get dates for this March where we will bring you know, jobs of the future and sustainability things to, um, to the table and offer and, and just inform the students and schools. So we have an, um, a science education department 
and they regularly bring um, students through. So as I mentioned, K through 12, there's buses that come through, you know, non-COVID, but uh, buses that come through to our science education center. There are high school programs, high school student programs over the summer, college student programs. So I can put you in touch with the director of that and maybe you should have a conversation with him because his name is Ken White. And I think um, that would be, you know, a good link up. That would be great. We would really appreciate that. And I'm okay, sure good. we have so many schools that would be interested in participating. So that would be a great partnership. Uh, should I get you my information in the, in the chat or does- Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank I'd you. Like to, I'd like to, if I, if I could, I'd like to uh, make a comment as well. Um, staying along the lines of what Tina just uh, was speaking about, um, Tina is a, a participant um, with our Smithtown Industry Advisory Board. And uh, so we've spoken and have seen each other a number of times and question was very similar to mine, except I wanna add something. So Diane, um, due to the uh, pandemic and the fact that nobody's doing much in person um, anymore. One of the things that um, uh, the Smithtown Industry Advisory Board has um, attempted to do is have um, local businesses do um, some sort of video um, uh, that we can then share in the classrooms, whether they be in person or online uh, with the students. Is there some um, videos uh, that, um, you know, could speak like, I mean, what you just did now is interesting. However, I, you know, great for us adults. I think, you know, the kids would fall asleep, but if you had um, a, you know, more interactive, I mean, some sort of video shows with the, uh, you know, the collider does that sort of thing that can be shown in classrooms to kind of peak their interest so that when we do open, that could be something to be like, hey, listen, I was really interested. Maybe we can, you know, do a trip there or do a special, you know, um, summer program with them. Yeah, so the lab has general videos, but I am sure that our education department has things that would be appropriate. Um, so if you put your contact info in for me also, I'll make sure that the both of you get contacted uh, with Ken White. Terrific, thank you, I really appreciate that. Okay, good. Um, this is Chris Kempner. I'm uh, very interested, I, I know Ken as well, but I'm also very interested in the education component. Um, we're, we're working with the Long Island Science Center and some of the local schools to develop more functional curriculum right now for, um, for, for the school system because of the pandemic and possibly the economic uh, repercussion, repercussions. So many children may have to take on jobs at a much earlier age than they normally would. So we were looking at two tracks, one being sort of more scientific and coding and, and the fact that the lab is here and we'll have this facility is really amazing. So if there's a way to sort of connect this group, uh, uh, it's wonderful. And I'd like to thank you very much um, to, to, to uh, Brookhaven Lab and the Miller Stein Center for, for having this presentation because it's extremely interesting um, in all aspects of it. And I would love if there continues to be these types of presentations as you move along so we can pace with you to, to hear about it. In fact, I just you know called a friend of mine that's a mega project scheduler and I was like, there are a lot of jobs that are, are being um, generated and I'm very just interested in the scientific community that you're bringing here. So thank you very much for the presentation, Ms. Hatton. Good.